The House Select Committee on China is cautioning that the Chinese Communist Party cannot be trusted and must be deterred. Lawmakers issued this warning during the committee's first hearing on Tuesday. It featured several witnesses who testified to the threats posed by the Chinese government. The bigger coup for the Chinese Communist Party, uh, if TikTok is permitted to continue operating in the United States, and if WeChat and, and other Chinese platforms are, con are allowed to continue to operate, is that it gives the Chinese Communist Party the ability to manipulate our social discourse, the news, uh, to censor and suppress or to amplify what tens of millions of Americans see and read and experience and hear uh, through their social media app. I think the other big lesson that we've been talking about and certainly Mr. Paul talked about is it's a big mistake to give an authoritarian regime coercive power over your economy. The economic policies of the Chinese Communist Party represent a clear and present danger to the American worker, our innovation base, and our national security. Well, joining us now is one of those experts you just saw testifying, retired General, Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster. He's a CBS News foreign policy and national security contributor, as well as a foreign, former national security advisor in the Trump administration. Always good to hear from you, H.R. Uh, so yesterday we saw you testifying that you believe that China poses an even greater threat to freedom than the Soviet Union once did. I think a lot of people were surprised by that. Explain why. Hi, Lana. It's great to be here with you and Errol. Well, it's, it's because the threat is much more pernicious. If you recall, during, during the Cold War, you know, we really recognized that the Soviet Union was a, a Marxist system that was challenging, really, the, the very nature of our democracy and our free market economies. With, with China, we've been laboring under this flawed assumption that, hey, China, if they're welcomed into the international economic order, they'll play by the rules, you know, and then they'll liberalize their economy. Uh, and then liberalize their form of governance. Well, well, they haven't done that. And what they've done is they've weaponized their mercantilist, statist economic model against us. And they take advantage, as you heard Matt Padre say, of our open society with the united front and a whole range of propaganda and, and, and subversive activities, you know, because we are an open society. And, and the problem is, you know, for many years, Lana, we just didn't, we just didn't, uh, we just didn't compete. We vacated key arenas of competition in the information space and economically and financially as well. Another thing you mentioned during the hearing is you discussed how effectively the U.S.'s failure to deter Russia from its invasion of Ukraine could kind of be instructive and offer insight into how the U.S. should move forward with relations with China and the island nation of Taiwan. Can you just connect the dots for us there and elaborate on, on how that's relevant? Well, well, thanks, Harold. I mean, I think first and foremost, hard power really matters, you know? So you hear, heard a lot before uh, before the renewed invasion of Ukraine in February of last year, that, hey, if, if you invade Ukraine, we're gonna pull out of sanctions on you, you know? And we had all these, if, you know, the if then, but, but and Ukraine didn't have sufficient military capability visible to the Russians to deter an attack, to convince Putin, hey, you can't accomplish your objectives through the use of force. Mm -hmm. So that ought to be the goal with Taiwan. I mentioned, I mentioned it during my testimony that there's a $19 billion backlog of weapon systems and various capabilities that the Taiwanese have already purchased. Hey, let's get in there, you know, and let's help the Taiwanese integrate those defensive capabilities. So hard power matters. And then, of course, there are some pretty important economic uh, lessons as well, right? I mean, you know, giving Russia coercive power over Germany's economy and Europe's economy in the form of dependence on Russian hydrocarbon experts. Hey, that was a big problem. And so we see that with certain aspects of our dependencies on China for fragile supply chains that, that, that gives critical capabilities. I mean, from pharmaceuticals uh, to the equipment and the hardware associated with the, with the energy transition, for example. Uh, so it, it's really important, I think, that we take the broad range of actions now to deter the People's Republic of China, but also to insulate uh, our economies across the free world uh, from the negative ramifications associated with, you know, what could be a rending of the of the our economic relationship with China, analogous to the rending of the economic relationship with Russia. You know, HR, as you're talking about the People's Republic of China, and we hear all this talk against the Chinese government over the past few weeks, I'm cognizant that you make that distinction between the government 
of the People's Republic of China and the people. Are you concerned, because others don't make that distinction, mm -hmm. that as these tensions continue to rise, that Chinese Americans and other Asian Americans here in the States could face backlash? It wouldn't be the first time in history we've seen that. Well, you know, that's due to ignorance, you know, and Lana, I, I thank you for bringing this up. You know, the, the, those who, who are the, the greatest victims of the Chinese Communist Party are the Chinese people. I mean, read Frank Decoder's full four volume history of the Chinese Communist Party. It's heartbreaking how many of their own people that they, they murdered, you know, through starvation, you know, it, uh, during the Great Leap Forward, through the Cultural Revolution. Look at the suppression of, of human freedom that you saw after Tiananmen Square, you know, for example. But hey, fast forward to today, they're committing slow genocide against the Uyghur mm -hmm. population. They're establishing this police state, they're extinguishing human freedom in Hong Kong. They have 47 people standing trial, you know, for saying, hey, I think we should have some rights here. So I, I think, Lana, this is really important. What we need is we need more Chinese immigrants. I mean, after Tiananmen Square, President George H.W. Bush said, hey, if you're here uh, on a student visa, you can stay. And about 75,000 Chinese students took him up on it. And of course, there were many, there are much fewer uh, Chinese students now than then than there are now. And, you know, they're some of our greatest, most productive citizens. That's our competitive advantage, right? People want to come here. Nobody's trying to immigrate to China. So I think it's really important to distinguish between the party and the Chinese people. Thanks. Thanks for bringing that up. Appreciate your take on that. Yeah. And it's true, right, for many of the criticisms. The government is not the people and, you know, folks shouldn't be um, criticized in such a way. H.R. McMaster, always great to have you join us. Thanks, thanks for HR. being with us today. Thanks, Harold. Thanks, Lana.